Welcome to Mayo Clinic Sleep Medicine Podcasts, a series for physicians, advanced practice providers, nurses, and other health practitioners treating sleep disorders or interested in learning about state-of-the-art advances in sleep medicine and sleep health. I'm your host, Dr. Michael Silber. And I'm your co-host, Dr. Maitri Juna. We are both consultants at the Center for Sleep Medicine at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Thank you all for joining us for today's podcast titled RLS, What Therapies Does the Future Hold? Current therapies for restless leg syndrome are far from perfect, as you have heard in some of our prior podcast recordings. There are many patients with severe restless legs who continue to struggle despite trying alpha-2 delta ligand agents such as gabapentin, dopamine agonists, and multiple opioids. And furthermore, iron therapy is not always helpful. What might be available in the future to help with this devastating condition? My guest today is Dr. Michael Silber, professor of neurology at the Mayo Clinic College of Medicine and Science and a board-certified sleep specialist. Mike, let us first start with the neuromodulatory therapies. There have recently been some encouraging trials of perineal nerve stimulation. Can you tell us a little bit more about these and what your take on the studies is? Yes. I haven't been personally involved in these studies, so what I'm going to give you is my own assessment from the literature. Um, We're talking about TOMAC, Tonic Motor Activation Therapy, and the most recent study was last year, a really very well done controlled trial. Um, It's extremely difficult to do controlled trials on stimulation therapy, but I think the investigators did their very best to blind it. Not completely possible to do so, as we'll hear in a moment. So how it worked was perineal nerves um, at the neck of the fibula were stimulated bilaterally. And they were stimulated for 30 minutes at any time during the day, a maximum of four sessions a day, depending on patient's individual symptoms. Um, There was individual titration of stimulus intensity. And the theory behind this is they, they were stimulating efferent nerve fibers in the perineal nerves that that goes through the spinal cord reflex and causes a slight tonic contraction through the effect or efferent muscles um, and a contraction of anterior tibial and presumably the other perineal innervated muscles. So the control trial consisted of 133 patients. 90% of them were on stable doses of um, drugs for restless legs. So it wasn't as if they were variable, varying the drugs, but they were on drugs. These weren't patients completely free of any medications. Um, they were studied using as outcome measures the clinician global impression of change as the main outcome. Um, and indeed, by week eight, 61% of the patients um, were felt to have had um, at least moderate or marked improvement. What was interesting was after eight weeks, it went to an open label study of 24 weeks. And at the end of that time, it went up from 61% to 73% of patients. Quite unusual in an open label extension to get bit further improvement after the end of the control trial. The other outcome measure was our classic international restless leg syndrome study group rating, and that fell at the end of eight weeks by eight points, which is generally considered significant and probably a little beyond placebo effect. And by um, 24 weeks open label, it had dropped 11 points. Again, sort of interesting that it seemed to be a persistent effect and perhaps even a little improved. Now, there are cautions. The investigators very sensibly asked the subjects, did you did you know which um, arm you were in? And unfortunately, 54% of them said, yes, we were in the treatment arm correctly. 14% guessed sham correctly. And a third of them said they didn't know. Now, the investigators asked them why they guessed correctly. And they said, well, that's because it worked or it didn't work. And that may well be true. But of course, you can tell from the stimulation a little bit that you're getting something real or not. So it's just a problem with blinding of stimulation studies. And there's no easy way around it. Um, 28% of the patients 
um, getting the real treatment said there was some discomfort compared to only 8% of the sham. So you see there was a way of perhaps telling a little bit, but they went on persisting with it. It wasn't severe. And interestingly, 14 out of 20 patients who were on opioids were able to reduce the dose once they started the stimulation. So I think this is very promising. It's not a cure for restless legs, but as this becomes commercially available, I understand in the course of 2024, it's likely to become commercially available in increasing markets. I look forward to trying it and seeing in the real world, is this helpful for at least our refractory patients? It's really nice to know that there are, you know, some non-medication treatment options. What about spinal cord stimulation, either through a transcutaneous device or an implanted electrode? Yes, there are about 16 case reports now of stimulation through an implanted electrode. Now, most of these, of course, weren't implanted for restless legs. That would certainly be a very off-label use. They were implanted for pain, but the patients also had restless legs, and the investigators asked them about that. Variable results, very hard to reach any definite conclusions. Then there have also been some small case reports and a couple of very small controlled studies on transcutaneous um, electrical st stimulation of the spinal cord, the TENS unit, again with variable results, um, nothing that we can absolutely say for sure works. And there's actually been some studies also, again, small numbers, small controlled studies, transcranial magnetic stimulation, but again, not large enough to reach any definite conclusions. I would like to see more studies on the TENS unit because that is so benign and well established for pain. I'd, I'd like to see some big studies on that, but they haven't been done yet. And what about devices providing leg vibration or pneumatic pressure? Do they really work? Um, as far as vibration devices go, uh, the studies are small, very difficult blinding problems with controlled studies, outcome measures often not classical. Um, and I'm not convinced that um, simple vibration to the legs is helpful. And the same applies to the compression studies where you put on compression um, systems and intermittent pulsation of the lower legs. Again, small numbers, difficult blinding, and sometimes unconventional outcomes measures. So both of those are entirely harmless. And I don't see any harm in difficult cases trying it. But I don't believe there's good evidence that either just general vibration to the legs or compression has been shown to be effective. Mike, do you know of any new classes of drugs that are currently being trialed or any old medications that you think we ought to bring yeah. back for managing this, this condition? Yes. Well, the first drug I should just mention is dipyridamol. You'll remember that's an antiplatelet agent used for um, to reduce risk of clotting. Um, but it's also an inhibitor of adenosine transport and increases adenosine. And there's some evidence that adenosine may be involved in restless legs. So there's one small randomized controlled trial from Spain, which was positive, but it was a small trial. I've tried dipyridamol in a couple of refractory patients without success, and they there are side effects and they can, it can drop blood pressure. So you've got to be careful. The person's on other antihypertensive medication. And with my extremely limited experience, I haven't been impressed so far. Um, then what about seizure medications? Well, you'll remember gabapentin started life as a seizure medication, not a particularly good one. Well, let's go back to 1984. In 1984, an enormous control trial of 174 patients was published from Denmark on carbamazepine and restless legs, and it was highly positive. But, of course, in those days, control trials weren't done as rigorously as they are today, and the, we didn't have the current measurements, the, uh, markers that we use. We didn't have the IRS score, so the endpoints they used were un, what today we'd consider unconventional, and the drug never took off. Uh, more recently, there's been a small open-label study of a newer drug called parampanol, 
which seemed to work in an open label study, but parampanol, um, I have no experience with it at all, my three, maybe you do, but it's got some nasty side effects such as homicidal ideation, which certainly scares me, and there's been no control trials of it. But I do wonder if we should go back to s trials of, anti of seizure medications. I mean, I'd like to see a trial of oxcarbazepine, um, sort of the derivative of carbamazepine without some of the um, bone marrow suppressant side effects. And we just don't know whether these drugs work in restless legs. Um, the last thing I suppose I should just mention is cannabis. Um, well, there are no controlled trials. There are a couple of open label studies, um, but we just don't know. We, as you know, formulation varies, mode of administration varies, dosages are unknown. Um, cannabis interacts with most of the other drugs we use for restless legs. And there are, of course, legal constraints, whereas more and more states have legalized it for either medical or recreational use. It's still quite illegal by federal law. The, uh, there was a whole long article in the New York Times yesterday saying that the DEA is considering moving it from cat, um, category one to category three, which would be a really major change. How exactly that would all work, I don't know. And I don't know if they're going to do it, but it's under consideration. I've spoken to a few people who've had experience in using cannabis, and their feeling is that giving it nasally, it has some short-lived benefit, but not a very long um, benefit. And I've had some patients who've tried, and that's been their experience as well, short-lived response, but an hour or two, and that's been about it. But if we're going to use it, we need to have controlled trials, and that will have to wait till it's been um, down classified and uh, trials can be done. Very helpful. So lots of potential uh, options for the future, it sounds like. Uh, what final messages would you like to leave with our listeners today, Mike? Well, I'd love to say we already control restless legs well, but we don't. There are many, many refractory patients. Um, the drugs we use have side effects. Um, they're not always effective. And we need, we desperately need new ways of managing it. And hopefully with time, either pharmacologic or non-pharmacologic methods will prove to be helpful. Anything we have additional is going to be beneficial to at least some of our patients. So I hope the future will be bright here. Thanks very much, Mike, and uh, to our listeners for joining us for today's podcast. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this podcast. If so, please tune in again through wherever you receive your podcasts as we discuss further topics in sleep medicine and sleep health. Thank you.